Driving north through the dales of Derbyshire, some of the most beautiful river valley country in Britain, you descend into the valley of the River Rother and the city of Chesterfield, our destination for this week's Antiques Roadshow. And why go all the way to Italy to visit foreign leaning towers when here in Chesterfield we have one all our own, the slightly less than perpendicular spire of St Mary and All Saints. Built in the 14th century here in the north of England, it spent the last 600 years going south. The crooked spire not only leans, but twists. Its curious, indeed unique appearance seems to have been the result of using green, unseasoned timber in the wooden frame construction. Hundreds of years of sun and rain caused the timber to split and develop its present distorted shape. But despite the fact that it's more than eight feet out of line, the spire, I'm told, is quite stable. This part of Derbyshire also boasts some of our finest country houses, of which Chatsworth is certainly one of the most magnificent. It's still very much the home of the Duke and Duchess of Devonshire. On a slightly smaller scale, and a few miles away, there's Haddon Hall. Uninhabited for 200 years, it's now been restored to its former glory. And this year, for the first time, all the antiques in our new competition will be coming from these, our great country houses. Well, all that a little later, but first to our hall in Chesterfield. It stands in Queen's Park, another of Chesterfield's great assets, being the most popular place in town to come and enjoy a picnic, a stroll, or visit an antiques roadshow. Among our team of experts this week, Eric Knowles will be covering his usual wide brief from the 19th and early 20th centuries, and Christopher Payne is our man on furniture. David Batty's here too, but we begin this week with Henry Sandon, who's already found a fine piece of pottery. Oh, what an absolutely splendid horse. Yes. I, I think he's absolute tremendous piece. I mean, wonderful body, wonderful stance, and the colours are simply fantastic. He, he's a great, great horse. Uh, how did you acquire him? Is he yours? Uh, unfortunately not, no. He belongs to a friend. Um, she can't be here today, so I offered to bring him along for her. Uh, it's been in the family for ooh, quite a few generations. I think he belonged to her great, great, great grandfather. So it goes right back. Yes. He would have been perhaps about the first owner. Of yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And they had connections with the pottery in Leeds, apparently. With the Leeds pottery. Yes. So hence you thought perhaps yes. it was a Leeds pottery yes. piece. Yes, I think it's probably what one generically calls Yorkshire. Yes. Yorkshire pearlware. Mm -hmm. This wonderful colour and um, very, very natural crazing. I mean, this sweet little slight little crackle on this glaze which is absolutely natural you do get fakes of these things which are and one has to be wary about yes. and um, yeah. they they have very nasty harsh large square crazing and um, and they don't look as natural or as beautiful as this this is absolutely subjust he's lost his ears i see which yes. is uh, yeah we do have them you've got, uh, got the yes, ears yes 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 ever yes they ought to be put back he really is in incredible condition. Yes. One generally doesn't find a horse in such splendid condition coming from that period. I suppose they were played with at the house or something like yes. that. Yes, the owner's father, as a child, he used to have it stood on his um, on the drawers in his bedroom. And his mother used to say, there's money in that horse. And he used to shake it, thinking that there's actually money inside. Thinking you it know. was a money box. Yes, so, yes. like, <laughs> so it's a miracle it survived. Yes, it is, yeah. And have they got any idea of its value? Um, I do believe one was sold a few years ago uh, in her family for about £5,000. Yes. The date of it's going to be around about 1810. Oh. Uh, so he's quite an early chap. And I would think in this condition, um, his value is going to be something like about six to £7,000. Oh, sure, we're pleased. To me, that's pure nostalgia. It won't be to you, but it's pure nostalgia to me. I mean, obviously, you've got the cat after the cream on the churn. I can remember those churns still being used when our old milkman used to come around with a three-wheeled cart with the churn on the top and ladle out the milk. This yeah. is pre-supermarket days. Now, with something like this, I mean, obviously, it's an extremely nice piece, and one would expect it to be a fine quality maker. You've got the, the mark there for George uh, Angel and the date letter for 1868. But a thing like this would have actually been registered at the patents office. So here, uh, not only have we got the date letter on the outside, which tells us it's 1868, but you can actually follow through the actual day that it was registered, which is on the 8th of February, 1868. So, you know, wonderful history behind it all. Uh, and it's such a, such a nice thing. I mean, it's the sort of thing that, in any sale room, it would appeal to several markets. I mean, you have a piece there, I suppose, that if it came up for public auction, 
would make possibly in the range of about six to eight hundred pounds. Thank you. Well, now we've got this out of the frame, we can see what it is. It's a porcelain plaque painted uh, with a cupid on a cushion. And immediately I saw it, I recognized that painting. Uh, it appears on a Rockingham porcelain uh, tray in Rotherham Museum. That one is signed by George Spate, who was one of the principal painters at the Rockingham factory. They started making porcelain in 1826 and finished in 1842. Now, we turn it over. It's lovely, isn't it? We've got here yes, the initials yes. GS 1832. Yes. So that fits in perfectly with George Spate having painted uh, a small porcelain plaque uh, some time later than he did the actual dish, the big dish. I think he's dated a little earlier than that. Uh, However, that's, that's fine. Now, there's something very interesting in the frame as well I want to look at. And here you've got painted by James Spate. Yes. I think this is a, a lesson to us that don't always believe what you see on old documents oh, that yes. <laughs> lie around. Because yes. it's definitely George Spate, yes. and it's bought from G.C. Bagley. That's another very interesting name, because Isaac Bagley took over the Rockingham factory when it closed in 1842. Oh, yes. So there's a nice sort of provenance in this yes. all the way through. We found this in a drawer afterwards, uh, when we were looking through some documents, yes. and that does relate to the plaque. So you've got a plaque, you've got a... a description of it there and this which tells us it was by George Spade oh, yes, and I actually yes. know the name of the antique dealer who's on this oh, letter here so <laughs> it's fascinating yes. to me to see it. That's right yes. Fine painting lovely detail here in the background and so on but it's difficult to put a, a, a firm valuation on it because if it's not come up for auction we've nothing to guide us but no. if that were in auction I would expect at least a thousand perhaps twelve hundred pounds as a minimum on it. Yes, yes. Uh, which is, uh, is uh, I think, fair price. Yes. Well, uh, we have occasionally used it to strain a bottle of port when we've had an old bottle of port, <laughs> just very often. Right, and of course vintage port is yes. as much yeah. as straining it. Absolutely right. I mean, it's, it's, it is a, a wine funnel and intended for vintage port, fine clarets, that sort of thing. The way they work is, is absolutely fascinating and, and often a bit misunderstood. This one comes apart, like so, and the piercing yes. there, um, that of course, as you poured the port through, would take, if you cracked open an old bottle, I mean, there could well skin. be bits of skin, yeah. bits of uh, cork even, and sometimes a little bit of glass if, if, if the bottles had to be literally yeah. cracked at the, at the top. So the really large bits would be filtered out by that. Now, there should, be a little ring fitting into that and of course the reason that you had a ring there was that you would put a piece of muslin across so that piercing took out the really large lumps but then the muslin took out the very fine sediment the design actually is, is really brilliant as you sort of look further into it because as it sits on the top of the decanter of course as you can see there it's um curved yes we wondered why there was a curve like that well, Yes, they're always curved because the, it directs the flow of the claret or the port to the side of the decanter. Oh. If it goes straight down, of course, it all churns up. The thumb piece here, always described as a thumb piece, but I'm quite convinced it was for clipping onto the side of a punch bowl. Oh. Also, it's ribbed there. Now, that's obviously part of the decoration here. Quite often, you've actually got projections. And the reason is, sitting in the top of the decanter, if you haven't got that, the whole thing starts to glug. In the earliest, you get her about 1760 or so. This one's a little bit later in date. Um, we're looking at, in fact, you can see there with the uh, hallmarks, we've got 1844. Um, and it's Riley and Stora as, as the makers. So, what would you pay for it? Only a few pounds, probably right. oh. five, ten pounds. It was right. all I could afford then. <laughs> <laughs> Today, if I was insuring that, I would insure it for, what, 800 pounds. Kidding. <laughs> <laughs> They've become so popular. All the wine buffs, they want things to do with wine. And That's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> that was a pretty good investment. You even got the cover, that's very nice. Okay, good. And what 
is this? Handwriting competition. <coughs> oh, that's charming, isn't it? Actually, in silver, too. Yes. Presented by the proprietors of Wright's Coal Tar Soap. <laughs> I don't believe it. <laughs> Amazing. Oh, well, we'll have to send you to our metal expert for that. <laughs> Now, isn't that beautiful? You see, treatment to get this beautiful sheen here, the bluing and the gilding, is mercuric gilding. Now, it's illegal to do this today because uh, if you inhale the fumes, it can kill you. So they stopped, stopped it in the 19th century. It was a 1796 pattern sword, so it came right in the Napoleonic Wars. It was used at Waterloo, and it wasn't replaced until 1821 with another pattern. It was sold by auction today. This sword would fetch in excess of 2,000 pounds. So I hope that pleases you. Yes, it does, yeah. Wow, well, fascinating. And that's that box. Yes. That's right. It's like unraveling history. <laughs> history coming to life. That's the most amazing thing I've ever seen, to see a 19th century still life come to life like that. It's absolutely fantastic. I must say, I was hoping to see a piece of um, local salt glaze wear today. And so I'm, I'm very pleased that you brought this puzzle jug along. It is local. It, it is local. Um, Chesterfield was one of the biggest producers of salt glazed wares throughout the 19th century. Um, there are various holes at, at the bottom, so you need to arrange your fingers over the various holes so that they're all covered up yes. and there's one in the handle right, which yes. particularly needs yes. to be got hold of yes. and then you suck on one of these yes. nozzles of the uh, to get the liquid up these make about 150 pounds perhaps 200 pounds for an example in such good clean condition as this is um, i suspect a lot of them were broken in sheer frustration of trying to get the liquid out there's everything with it wardrobe towel rail Wash One stand. of these wash stands. Wash stand, right, with a marble top, right. Yeah. And um, obviously these two pieces here. Do you have a pair of beds with it? No, there's one bed, full-size bed. A double bed. Well, that makes yeah. quite a difference. Yeah. The idea of painted furniture generally came into popular use in the Georgian period. Yeah. Uh, one of the most famous people I can think of, Thomas Chippendale, made a suite of furniture for the famous London actor David Garrick yeah. in the 1760s, 1770s. Mm. In this sort of style, but I'm not pretending for a minute this is anything but a Victorian copy. Uh, the most interesting thing to me is the, the way it's made and the quality of the workmanship. Yeah. The painting is actually painted onto mahogany. And when you look here in the cupboard, you can see the mahogany ground. Yes, really see. nice quality. Of course, it's a lovely finish too. Yeah. When you open it, you see this nice quality of mahogany. Mm. But the reason for doing it is that in the 1870s and, and 80s, the cabinet makers discovered that the mahogany would take the paint better, so it wouldn't chip off or peel off. Some of the giveaways of this Georgian style is this little chap here, this little putty yeah. or cherub, mm. in very much the style of somebody called Angelica Kaufman, who was a painter, a lady painter, working in the Georgian period in many of the great country houses of England. Yeah. And her designs, being these sweet little Victorian-looking faces, if yeah. you like, were very, very much copied in the Victorian period, mm. towards the last 20 or 30 years of the, of the last century. Yeah. So good quality, interesting, and really very unusual. Um, what did you pay for this, do you know? Eighteen pounds. And how long ago was that? About 35 years ago. Right. Well, I've got to do some sums now. Let's go through it. You've got a tower rail. Well, that yes. must be worth a couple of hundred pounds. Yeah. This, I think, is probably worth nearly a thousand pounds on its own. Yeah. This dressing table. You've got a washstand. Yeah. You've got the table behind us and the chair. So that is probably three thousand pounds worth of value. Yeah. But what interests me, and the piece we can't see, is the bed. Because single beds are worth nothing but a bed which people can use today yeah. can be worth two or three thousand pounds, possibly four to five thousand really? pounds. So obviously without seeing it, but assuming it does match, no, yeah. that is by far the most valuable <coughs> part of the suite. Yeah. Certainly five thousand yeah. pounds for the whole suite, possibly up to eight thousand no, pounds. Very nice. Really quite rare. Where it was mm. made, I don't know. No, no. But somewhere in England, possibly London. Mm. Very nice. Thanks for bringing it in. Right. Uh, well, one of the things which I wanted most of all when we came to Chesterfield was to find some Pinkston porcelain, and here we have it. Just 12 miles from where we are today, and amongst the rarest, isn't it, of all English porcelains. It is, yes. Um, 
this little piece here, a beautiful little can made at Pinkston by William Billingsley. Yes. Billingsley came from Derby, where he was an outstanding and famous painter, uh, set up and started making porcelain about 1797. He left in 1799, wasn't it? That's right, Just yeah. very short period here. Well, I haven't seen this pattern before. It's a really super piece. Um, the shape of the handle, of course, is very important. That tells us as much as anything, it's That's a Pinkston, yeah. absolutely perfect Pinkston shape. Uh, and it really is a super piece, that. Um, here we have a fluted bow with this nice border pattern, uh, but it's one you would expect to find and, yeah. and recognize as Pinkston fairly easily. Both this one here and this have the same name or initials. That says JC and this says John Chapel. Now, one of the interesting things about Pinkston porcelain and any Billingsley porcelain is its quality. And this is beautifully translucent. It's a lovely creamy paste. And an interesting glaze, which I always, one of the ways I can tell Pinkston is it's got an iridescence on the That's glaze, right. and just like petrol lying petrol on water. water. That's yeah. absolutely. And also, I don't know whether you probably have spotted this as well as I have, the way it has a curtain of glaze down, yeah. running down there. The thick glaze has run down the pot there, and it really is. It's some of the most beautiful porcelain ever made, and yes. this beaker is particularly unusual um, in size. There are others known, and I think this can is unusual. Can I ask you, how much did you pay for that can? If I remember correctly, £275. Well, it, it's, uh, it's a fair price, that, um, but I would still think you, you did quite well out of it. Uh, yeah. I would have valued it at over £300, because they're so rare, 300 yeah. to £350, it's very high. Uh, that's a little lesson, I believe there's a little damage on that one. So long something like £150 probably on that one. And well, this one as recently as last Sunday. Last Sunday? Yes. You brought it straight to the roadshow, that's marvellous. Right, right. And how much did you pay for that? £350. Yeah. £350. Well, again, you've got a great rarity, and you yes. have to pay for rarity, and you've got... I haven't seen one with a name on before, so you've done very well. When I look at a clock like this, I never really know whether I'm looking at a clock or a piece of furniture because the two are so beautifully combined in these early 19th century clocks. Um, they used to be called eight-day wardrobes in the trade, very disparagingly. Um, the dial is very nicely painted. Not only have we got the moon phase, but in the corners, which are called the spandrels, we've got the four continents. But did it come from the Isle of Man? Yes, yes, it was uh, in the house. I think my gran grandmother bought right. shortly after the war. Right, but anyway, <laughs> here it is back in England. Uh, not a million miles from where it was made, in Birmingham, in the second quarter of the 19th century. And obviously, m Mr. Muncaster would have been the retailer. It's mahogany, what's called a flame figure, for obvious reasons, and in many cases, it's been halved, and you've got this butterfly effect. The cross-banding is all rosewood. In a sale, this would make getting on for a £1,000. You should therefore insure it for 1500 It's a nice thing. Thanks for bringing it in. Okay. We will be told that, he, that it was a self-portrait by Lowry. Yes, and yes. of course the drawing is thought to be by Ellis Lowry, who yes. made um, industrial, northern industrial yes, landscape famous. Yes, he did, didn't he? And um, here you've got a signature. Yes. Now the thing is that there are a large number of fakes. I believe drawing. so. That's why I've always wondered about this yes. one. Yes. Well, one has to be a little bit careful. Mm -hmm. But I think that really it is a, probably an early you think drawing. So? Mm -hmm. One tends to think of Lowry's drawings being those little matchstick yep, figures right. and so on. Yes. So those are the kind of drawings which tend to be faked. So yes. I think there's a good chance oh. that this is probably right. I think it has a number of weaknesses, a little bit in it. Um, mm -hmm. He's searching to give it three dimensions, but in fact it still appears a little bit flat mm -hmm. with the cross hatching here on yes. the scarf and um, yes. underneath the brim of his hat. Now, on the question of actual value, then I would have thought that something like 1500 Two thousand pounds. You do. I wouldn't have expected it to be quite so much. I think. Well, it's a wonderful, interesting, and varied collection of watches. Uh, have you been collecting for a while, or are they presents, or um, what? I had a couple given me about ten years ago. They were my granddad's, and he passed away last year, so I got the rest last year. It was actually a, a watch and clock repairer. Let's take the nearest one to me. A silver pair case Verge watch. And I have you read this motto yes, around here? I have, it's yes. rather quaint, isn't it? Keep me clean and use me well, and I to you the truth will tell. Yes, which is basically it. saying, keeping chaps like him in work. You know? <laughs> Bring it back often for a clean and it'll keep running. 
Um, good collector's object in the current market, that one. Date about 1825, 1830. And here's another pear-cased English Verge watch, again with a decorative dial. A typical farmer's verge with what we tend to call a speed the plow scene. Again, very pretty with this naive farmer and uh, two horses. There's a big chunky one. Do you like that one yes. or not? Well, yes, it's nice with it. Is it tortoise? Yeah? It yeah. is uh, a good example, in yeah. fact, of that. There's yeah. a bit of damage on that front bezel, but nothing that couldn't be restored okay. fairly well. A superb dial beetle and poker hands and well what a beautiful movement this one we'll be dating at about 1725 1730 is this wonderful face on the balance cock and these superb Egyptian pillars I mean they are really lovely yeah. and this really just looking at more must be the nicest one yes, nice, okay in an English pear cased watch in 22 karat gold typical classical scene the important thing about these is that the condition has to be perfect yes. and let's just see who the maker is and what date it is it's by a maker called Blackborough and uh, London Hallmark looks to be 1734 and again a lovely, lovely watch. I must say, in fact, that that white enamel dial is not original. The Keep Me Clean, yes. at the moment, they're fetching about 250 to 280 at auction. The Speed the Plow, with an original dial, is a similar sort of figure. This George Etherington, in the region of 700 to 1,000 pounds. And this very, very crisp 22 carat repoussé case watch, between 1,500 and 2,000. All in all, a fabulous present, and I'm glad that you're interested in them. Thank you very much. Thanks. This is your name. This is your name, Matondi. So, are you going to? Um, this is. You know what this is? This is a money box. Yes, yeah, seen them. <laughs> <laughs> he, are you putting his? Are you putting his savings? Well, there's a story behind it because uh, my mother used to see it in the shop yes. every day, like when she was going to work. She'd be about 16 at the time, and uh, she fell in love with it, and she kept telling my father, like, it's only caught in there. And then one day um, she went past the shop and said, gone. She come home crying. Oh, says, Mum, yeah. Mum, teddy bear's gone. Yes. She says, I know it's gone. My mother says, What do you mean? And gra my grandmother said, Oh, it's come to live here. Oh, it's And my mother burst into tears yet again. I think been the that's house a since. wonderful story. You should always keep it in the family. Well, keep we are. The story. I think that's tremendous. Well, now we leave our experts just for a moment for me to tell you about our new competition and to remind you, of course, that every week you'll stand a chance of winning a roadshow voucher to the value of two and a half thousand pounds, which you can then spend on antiques of your choice. And also, for the first time this year, there's an additional prize of a specially designed and very attractive enamel box. Now, all the antiques in this competition are coming from country houses around Britain, and this very beautiful chair comes from Haddon Hall, it's one of a set of ten chairs from the Elizabethan Long Gallery. They form part of the furnishings introduced by the ninth Duke of Rutland when he returned to restore Haddon Hall to be a family home. Now the chair in walnut with its elaborately carved back, the turned legs and the inset central stretcher there are absolutely typical of the end of the 17th century. The seat was recovered in 18th century petty point embroidery. Now the overall design of this chair reflects very much the influence of a man who was famous for his interpretations of the Baroque style. He was actually a French Protestant refugee who spent most of his life in Holland, but he came here to England to work at the end of the 17th century. And so the question is, what is his name? Was it Francis Lapierre, Louis Le Gagneur, William Kent, Daniel Marot, or was it Grinling Gibbons? Now, if you'd like to take part, your entry needs to be in the post, please, by next Saturday, and addressed to Antiques Roadshow Competition, P.O. Box 161, Northampton, NN3, 1ZZ. And if you'd like a copy of the rules, then please enclose a stamped addressed envelope to the same address. The winner, by the way, is the first correct entry out of the hat. So, the best of luck with that. Another competition object at the same time next week. Now, back to our experts and the people of Chesterfield.
you've brought in a, a German painted tin plate egg vending machine. This type of thing one might regard as a little bit of nonsense. Far from it. Recently there's been a, a, a resurgence of interest in old mechanical gadgetry and such things have really become very collectible. Even in this condition you're going to be looking at a an auction sale price today of 1800 pounds. What a spot of luck we found this. Did you know about it? I had no idea. What is it? It's a signature, or at least a monogram, PG. Re really? And what is that for? I had no idea. No. And I think but... we probably would never find out who it was by. Oh, I, I had no idea it was there. It's extraordinary. I mean, of every 5,000, yes. 10,000 pieces of furniture of this date, yes. not one of them will be signed. I probably won't see another piece in my career initialed like this. Do you know what date it is? Well, I only know by the, the uh, label in the drawer, King Charles II. It's exactly the time Is it? people were coming from Holland yes. to England to make furniture. Yes. Now, King Charles II, well, I wonder if that's a little bit hopeful. I mean, James II a little bit later, yes. possibly even William and Mary, towards oh. the end of the 17th century. Yes. Can we just move it forward? Thank you. It's, what, just under six feet tall? Yes, it is. So it could go anywhere. Yes. It's a really lovely proportion. Mm. The rarest thing about this, perhaps apart from the signature, is the, is the wood. Have you ever tried to identify what the wood is? I think I assumed it was you. Exactly. It is you. It is you wood, which yes. is fairly rare. Most of the f f furniture in the late 17th century would be in either solid oak, country oak, yes. or in walnut. And the whole thing is absolutely as it was made. Is it? Nothing has been touched. No. And the good thing about it, not even the stand or the bun feet, but quite often those feet are replaced. The second thing people will ask about looking at a piece of furniture like this is, oh, well, it was cupboards and it's been turned into glazed panels. Yes. I don't think so, though. Let's no. have a look. It all works perfectly well. Mm -hmm. the, oh, smell. Yes. Wonderful smell of polish and years and years. Yes. It's a sort of really old, family-inherited type uh, right. piece of furniture. Yes. Yes. Have you had it for a long time in the family? No, we bought it, uh, I think, in the late 50s. Nice original iron hook, yes. fairly crude, very simple. Yes. A bit later on, it would have been in brass, tucked away up here, perhaps, or on the doors yes. themselves. Mm -hmm. But what I want to look at is just let's prove to ourselves whether or not this is old glass, mm. certainly. Well, the first thing is the bubbles in it. Easy enough to replace, but yes. difficult to fake those bubbles, I think. But all, all, would they be? I mm -hmm. think so, but also mm -hmm. you can see little ripples in the glass. Yes. But when you just look here and the quality of all this, yes. this is all the original putty that's been painted over, mm. painted to darken it down so that yes. it looks more like the wood of the pine that, it, that the carcass is made of. Yes. Little brass catch at the top, yes. gilded brass, yes. just sort of beginning to wear off now. Yes. Nothing to worry about. Yeah. All original. Mm. Nothing has been altered. Mm -hmm. That's very unusual. So, a rare piece of furniture. Extraordinary to have that signature. I'm um, amazed to see that. Have you got it insured? Uh, no, not um, and haven't had it valued individually. By no, right, no. right. It's just in with the family. I think it's with got with to be separately insured. Hasn't it? Because at least at auction, you'd expect to get six to eight thousand pounds for it. Would at I? least. Yes. A sorry. real cracker. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. And thank you. Thank you. I. Um, I went to the library and found a book on Staffordshire cow creamers and I brought it along today because I thought it perhaps was an early Staffordshire one but I've never seen one with a milkmaid on before. Right. This particular beast started off life in Newcastle and was almost certainly made by the St Anthony's pottery. It, was only, it wasn't a very big pottery but they did make some very fine animals, horses included. But the giveaway is down here. If you look and it's, just, it's only a, a minor detail. But you see that, you look at the hooves. Have you seen how they're cut away? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. That is very typical of St. Anthony's factory. Not only that, the base is it's just a very thin slab, right? It is quite a rare thing. And it's nice to be in such reasonable condition. If I'm speaking up, it's just that I've noticed he's got one mm -hmm. ear missing. So he's obviously deaf at that side. But let's just have a look at that milkman. Can you see that? I mean, it's all there. Lovely little milk pail with its tiny little hand still intact. The only damage, apart from the ear, is on this ridiculous little cover. 
I mean, it's completely impractical. I mean, if you were to pour that, I'm sure sooner or later it would, it would drop out. I don't want to do it. And your Geordie cow was probably made about 1825 or possibly 1830. Cow creamers have always been popular. Um, I have to say that last year, um, somebody unleashed a herd of them onto the, onto the market. And that did, obviously, it depressed the prices somewhat. But our Geordie cow would command at least £600 if he turned up oh, at any market. Well, he'd obviously have to turn up in the cattle, cattle market, market, wouldn't he? It's the only place for him. I think he's actually grown a smile on his face since I said that. No, he's always had one. That's Has why it? I like him. Oh, good. Are you a soul collector? No, I'm not. No. So why, but, why, why have you got this? Uh, well, I always had my eye on it. Uh, my grandmother kept it in a glass case. Oh, well, there's a certain logic to that. <laughs> Um, where did she get it from, do you know? She was given it by some friends in um, Japan early on in the century. They got it in Japan in, at the early of the century? Yes, right, yes. Right, well, that would make absolute sense, because that's when this dates from. Uh, I would call this an Iguchi, which is a small dagger. The samurai, of course, uh, carried two swords, the long tanto blade, which he used for fighting, and a short dagger, uh, which he actually used mostly for ritually disemboweling himself when he was ordered to by his lord. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, his, he his head was cut off with his sword by somebody else, so he didn't suffer, because you weren't allowed to shout out bad form. Um, this, of course, no samurai would be seen dead with. Um, <laughs> it's purely a decorative piece uh, made really for the export market. This, at this date, and we're talking about late last century, yeah. uh, Japan had been opened up to Western trade. And the sword had been banned in Japan in the 1870s. They were no longer allowed to wear it. But of course, the sword makers wanted something to do. And they were allowed to continue making uh, swords for export. Yes. And this was the sort of thing they produced. Japanese blades were the best in the world. Um, but here we've got something which is really, quite honestly, very, very poor. It's just badly engraved and nothing. But what is great is the sheath that is Show on the outside. Show on the outside. Um, we've got a wooden base, and that's been lacquered in gold, and that's what the gold is underneath there. That's been overlaid with tooled and pierced uh, silver. Um, this is actually probably a metal called Shibuichi, which is a mixture of uh, silver, some gold, and bits of other. I mean, the Japanese were better at making amalgams of metal than anybody. They've never been equal. A lot, lot of the processes have now been lost. We don't know how they did it. And then it's been enameled uh, in coloured uh, enamels uh, in a mixture of sort of just plain enamelling and a cloisonne technique, which you get uh, around here. This little piece is called the Kozaka um, and was used for eating, for chopping up food. Yeah. I said there was a, it was appropriate for your grandmother to uh, have it because some of these small daggers, not as elaborate as this, uh, were used by women. And the wife of, uh, of a samurai would have a dagger for self-protection. And indeed, if her husband was ordered to commit uh, seppuku, which is ritual suicide, she would then cut her own throat with her dagger. <laughs> I don't think this was My ever used. Died of natural yeah, causes, natural causes. Wonderful to hear that. <laughs> That's terrific. Um, having said all that, I think it's a, it's a fabulous piece, and these, because of their quality, are now very, very collectible. I mean, that is superb. I think that would probably make somewhere in the order of um, three to five thousand pounds. A devotional book of which many were printed in the 17th century. They're not particularly rare, they're not particularly uncommon. They were always. Let's open this up and have a better look at it. Wow. <laughs> it's amazing marketing work. Have you ever seen anything like it before? Well, not really. That was the thing that fascinated us, really, to start with. It's quite extraordinary. It came up at a local auction about a, a month ago, which I bid at, but it didn't reach its reserve value. And the right. auctioneer then phoned up some days later, knowing that we'd bid for it, and Pam very fortunately bought it as a gift. I didn't know anything about it. Well, so, so your wife bought it for you as a gift? She did indeed. After the sale? That's right. Absolutely amazing. And what attracted you to it? Well, it's lovely, absolutely beautiful. It's like monkeys. I think they're lovely and birds. And 
a lovely thing altogether. I mean, just soak up the quality of this work. If it was painted, it would be brilliant. It's like a painting, isn't, isn't it? it? Mm. But it's actually marquetry, which I'm sure you're aware. It's extraordinary to think somebody's been able to make something like this in tiny, tiny pieces of wood mm. and put it all in like this. First thing is that it's French. It's fairly typical of a French form. Um, what I like is the idea of these anthropomorphic uh, monkeys. Mm -hmm. Tremendous quality of work and very similar to some 18th century paintings and tapestries. Right. In my opinion, there's only one man who could have made this sort of quality work. His name is Joseph Kramer, and he exhibited a very important exhibition in Paris in 1855. And so I would date this about almost exactly the same. I dare say further research might, might in Paris, find out the designs for this table. You may be able to pin it down more accurately as to when it was actually made. Kramer sometimes signed his, his work. Oh, <laughs> I've tried to find the signature. Well, yeah. The problem is how he did it. Now let's pick anywhere. Let's just here. Look at the bird here. Mm -hmm. He would often, one of these tendrils of the flowers would yes. just end it with a little J Kramer. Oh, and you'd look for hours and mm. hours and you wouldn't find it. Then, then, yeah. then you'd look again and then one day you might find it. I've looked, not for hours, I cannot see his signature. We look here at this amazingly complex detail of flowers. You've got three or four different cuts of wood, mm. of different woods, to give shading of the depth of the flower, to give it a three-dimensional effect. I mean, you could almost pick that up and smell it. So strong, so good. The colours have faded a bit. I'm not worried about that at this stage at all. I would say, however, don't let it be in the sun. Don't let it fade anymore. But it's, in my opinion, in museum quality. Now, value. The museum piece was bought by the Paris Museum for, if I remember correctly, over £40,000. It was a big table, bigger than this. A year ago, at auction again, was a piece of this similar marquetry by the same man in an American cabinet that went and sold to an American museum for over £20,000. Now, what did you pay for this? £10,000. £10,000. And you bought it as a gift for £10,000. Yes. I think that's an excellent buy. Very well done indeed. Good price. I'm pleased about that. <laughs> I just liked it and I thought, it's a lot of money you've bought wrong, isn't it, really? You've not bought wrong at all. You've bought it absolutely right. A fantastic piece of French Napoleon III furniture. Thank you. Thanks very much. There, on the third day of October 1803, this piece of plate was unanimously voted to be presented to Christopher Cole, Esquire, one of the late sheriffs, of the honourable and faithful manner in which he discharged the duties of his office. For, at a period when rebellion and outrage uh, convulsed part of the kingdom, um, perfect order and tranquility were preserved in this district by the spirited exertions and activity of our high sheriffs. So I mean, they were really doing a spl splendid thing. They don't say what he was doing. Well, <laughs> now, this actually is, is fascinating to see. Just underneath, and it's very, very rarely that you come across it, the engraving is actually signed. And it's J. Green Sculpt. Yeah. Hardly any engraving on silver is ever found with a signature. Engravers are very much considered almost the lowest of the low. Oh, uh, of, in, the, in the engraving world, <laughs> if they're engraving on silver. So rarely will that signature be found. So we've got this fascinating inscription, which of course re uh, refers yeah. to the 1798 rebellion in Ireland. That makes it a very interesting mm. tray. But it gets even better. Because, and we look over here, the marks, sterling, straight across there. Yes, yes. Two places you find that in particular, or you can get it later in America, that sort of thing, but Cork and Limerick in Ireland marked with the word sterling in full. Yes. Most usually, there are one or two yes. rare early marks. Cork silver is quite difficult to find. Um, and it is literally just the sterling mark together with the maker's mark. And the maker here, important cork maker, Carton Terry and John Williams. 
uh, fascinating as well that they obviously got a bit enthusiastic about the fact they were marking it and very proud of what they made because they've marked it again over there. Oh. So, absolutely splendid tray. I think you're going to have to insure that for about £10,000. Oh. Right. Oh, goodness gracious. <laughs> so, it's a marvellous piece of silver. Absolutely marvellous. Well, and, I'm um, astounded. <laughs> really am. Oh. Music hath charms, they say, to soothe the savage beast. And, uh, this is very interesting. This has got a, a man playing a flute um, and playing, obviously, towards his girlfriend who's playing the lute. And they're pointing in the direction of this little tiny bird, right? whether you've noticed a little bird who's up in the branch of a tree, singing away like mad. He's sort of singing to the tune. Yes. And, uh, I suppose the scene copied from a song sheet of the time. It's very nice. And a little poem at the bottom, which is perhaps not great poetry, but the, the heart is in the right place. It said, my heart is fixed. It cannot range. I like my choice too well to change. Uh, and success to Joseph yes, Brumhead. Do you yes. know who Joseph Brumhead was? I've got an idea. I've been researching the family, and I think he was baptised in 1699. Yes. And I uh, wonder if he received this after his apprenticeship. I, I think the bowl is a little bit later yes. than that. I, yeah. I'd put it in date about 1740, 1750. Yes. Uh, and the whole style of decoration looks like that. Yes, and um, yes. where do you think it was made? Well, I thought locally. But um, no, it isn't a Derbyshire pot. No, uh, no. It's, uh, it's from uh, the Delft manufacturers. It's made in a tin glaze pottery. Very characteristic are these little chips around the rim, where the rim frays, the glaze comes off, and you're left with this brown earthenware below it. And um, that's very typical of um, Delftware. But I think one thing that particularly intrigues me is the, the little dots around these, um, these flowers masses of little tiny dots almost as if the flowers have got measles around yes, them and yes. that's very characteristic on porcelain terms of liverpool oh yes and it's absolutely charming i love the decoration i, I even like the damage uh, up here are metal rivets to hold yes, the pot yes. around this gorgeous little wonderful landscape it, it's a rare bowl yes if this were perfect i would think somewhere in the region of about 1250 pounds really but yes. being damaged I think yes. we're looking at something worth about £400. Yes, very good. Yes. And with that, I'm afraid, we come to the end of our visit to Chesterfield, where, among many fine things, we found this magnificent Sutherland table. And not, perhaps, as one might have expected, one of those large button-back settees named, it said, after the Earl of Chesterfield. Well, as always, the Antiques Roadshow is pretty unpredictable, and I'm sure it will be next week at the same time when we're off to Lincolnshire. So until then, from all of us here, 